Welcome to Reicher and Stark. I'm Bernhard Reicher. And my name is Rudolf Stark. This is a two-part conversation with Joshua Kutchin. We are having a roundtable talk about UFOs, fairy lore, Celtic legends, ghost stories, brainwaves and psychedelics. As it happens in Skype conversations, the audio quality isn't the best sometimes. We made some efforts to enhance it and hope you enjoy our show. Reality is debatable. Mysteries, mindfuck and magic. A podcast where the imaginal meets the phenomenal. With Bernhard Reicher and Rudolf Stark. So, welcome Joshua Kutchin to our show. Hi there. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm, I'm quite excited. <laughs> We too. And uh, uh, let's start with a, a little story we uh, had this day, actually. A great synchronicity. And I think it will be a great uh, starting off point. You know, we did an interview again uh, yeah, several, several months ago with uh, Betsy Poole. She's an American and she lives in northern Italy in the community of Damanhur. And she um, taught us about her abduction experiences. She, she told about uh, how they stopped when she got something to eat from the other. And Rudolf and I looked at each other and said, wow, that sounds exactly like it should be in your book. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then last time we did a show about, you know, fey folk and uh, the paranormal. And then uh, we said, okay, now we have to get Joshua on the phone and we have to talk with you about all this stuff. Yesterday, as we met to prepare this show and, and to, to go over the questions we had for you, Rudolf told me that he had just started to, um, to read Gordon White's Starships. Yes. And, uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It's, it was, I think, my most important book in 2017. And uh, Rudolf said, yeah, there was this one paragraph that, that still stays with me. And I immediately knew what paragraph he was talking about, just intuitively. And I said, yeah, you know that this one sentence where uh, Gordon says, uh, yeah, the, the materialists, they are swimming in our pool. And <laughs> we talked about that and uh, about uh, this uh, materialism that has ended. And today, in preparing for this show, I read your essay on um, reframing the debate yes. and you <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the essay is about um, leaving materialism behind and you ended this essay with exactly the same paragraph from Gordon White. Yeah. It's a great it's a great quote. Um, yeah, I amazing. think I think Starships is is a, actually a really important book and it's one of those books where I mean you know I we all have expressed our love for that particular paragraph but there are multiple paragraphs in that book where <laughs> I had to stop and think about it and reread it and uh, in in a good way. Um, mm -hmm. I'm 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 quite a quite a big fan of of uh, of Gordon's work and yeah that was that was really the inspiration uh, for my essay in last year's uh, book, uh, UFOs Reframing the, De the Debate, that was put together by Robbie Graham. Um, it was a blog post that sort of evolved into that essay, and uh, now I've put, it, put the entire essay on my website now that it's actually been over a year since that book has been released. So, um, yeah, that, <laughs> that, that, is, that is quite fortuitous. Uh, it seems like you've just been stumbling through synchronicities. And, you know, in my experience, synchronicities mean that you're on the right track. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever the track might be, yeah, I have no idea, but it seems the right track. <laughs> something is something is laying down a path that it wants you to follow. I think exactly. whenever you whenever that, yes, yeah. So um, tell our listeners a bit about yourself, Josh. Uh, what's uh, your path been leading you to? Oh wow! Um, good thing. Good thing I have enough time to, <laughs> to talk about. It. Um, I am. Uh, I am a uh, classically trained tuba player. Um, I teach uh, low brass instruments and uh, play uh, mostly at this point jazz uh, tuba um, for a living. Um, 
And uh, it was sometime around, I believe it was probably 2014, um, I had a day job that I have since quit, and I'm, I'm living the dream now. Um, but uh, I, I, was, I was in the day job, and I was looking for something to make my life a little bit more exciting. And I stumbled upon uh, this book uh, called uh, Rain Coast Sasquatch by this man named uh, J. Robert Alley. And I remember very vividly re- reading a passage in that book about uh, Native American lore that said that if you took food from the Bookwas, which was this particular tribe's name for Sasquatch or Bigfoot, um, that you would be trapped with the Bookwas forever. And I'd always sort of had a passing interest in in, uh, Celtic and uh, continental European fairy lore. And that particular motif of the idea of taking food from the fairies and being stuck in fairyland forever is, is, is one that I'd always really noticed. So I found that to be really compelling, that you'd have these cultures that were so vastly separated um, really engaging with the same sort of uh, same sort of folklore motif. So I sat back and I said, "Well, certainly someone's going to write this book." And I waited, <laughs> I waited. <laughs> you know, it was, it was just, you know, Nick Redfern will write it or something along someone along those lines. But um, but uh, no one ever did. So I said, "Well, maybe maybe I should do this because I'd always you know I'd I'd always had a had a soft spot for uh, for writing, and I took the leap and I wrote." Uh, a book that turned out to be my first book, uh, Trojan Feast, uh, from 2015. And uh, my life got very surreal because, uh, for you know, I'd always had a passing interest in this sort of thing. And I'd had a lot of the books by, uh, by Jerome Clark and by uh, Patrick Weege. And now here I am, you know, in my early 30s. And I'm I'm working with Patrick Weege. I'm getting reviews from Jerome Clark. It's, it's almost like, you know, uh, the I feel sometimes like the, uh, like the, child basketball fan or something ends up doing pickup games with and with a uh, NBA players. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 it's a bit, it's a bit surreal sometimes to think that I'm actually, uh, some of these people are actually now my friends. Like I consider them my friends. Um, and, uh, so I, I, I was, I was, I was fortunate and blessed enough to have that book, uh, uh, be relatively well, well received. So I said, well, let's do another one. So I ended up uh, releasing my second book in 2016, late 2016, which was The Brimstone Deceit, which is all about the various smells that you find in, in the paranormal, um, with a special focus on a lot of the sulfurous odor you find. Um, with with a name like The Brimstone Deceit, it almost sounds like I'm going down the you know Judeo-Christian deep. But I'm not. I promise. I promise. It's a, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Um, and then I've just completed my third book, which should be out by the end of this summer. Uh, it's in, that's uh, tentatively t- entitled uh, "Thieves in the Night," which is all about uh, paranormal uh, child abduction, uh, tracing the similarity of paranormal child abduction in the fairy faith, um, of especially European fairy faith. Mm-hmm. Um, also, looking at uh, uh, child ab- paranormal child abduction in cultures around the world, and then seeing how all of that is reflected in the modern UFO era. So, I'd I'd have to say that if there's one thing, one one uh, drum that I like to bang, <laughs> if if you'll take the uh, the analogy, um, it's that uh, the modern abduction experience, not necessarily the UFO phenomena, but the abduction experience particularly, is is basically a repackaged, repurposed version of a lot of the old fairy motifs that you used to see, uh, especially as it relates to European fairy lore. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're uh, exactly in the footsteps of Jacques Vallée. Well, I, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that myself as someone who, as someone who, who, who admires Vallée, uh, you know, and, and who will never, I will never reach the, uh, the, the, the depth of analysis that people like Jacques Vallée uh, have reached. But, uh, I, he's, he remains very much an inspiration an inspiration, yeah. uh, you know, to, to this, to this work. Um, uh, yeah, Vallée is a, is a big influence. Um, we were talking about Gordon, Gordon's, um, a big influence and someone that I consider a friend as well. Um, you know, I, I think that if you go all the way back to the early Charles Fort stuff, I mm-hmm. think that he proposed a lot of things that still have a lot of of weight to them today. And I feel like sometimes I get frustrated with the UFO community because I feel like they don't they they're all, they, they, I feel like they try to make it. Someone said this to me the other day uh, regarding fairy lore. My, my 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 opinion is that even if 
Whenever I'm comparing the UFO experience to the fairy experience, I'm not saying that everything is a fairy. You know, my, my Twitter handle for a while was therefore faithful. Yeah, instead exactly. of therefore <laughs> but I'm not saying that everything is, I'm not saying that everything is fairy, but rather that fairy folklore seems to have an analog for a lot of aspects of this phenomena. And as a friend of mine said, you know, why are we trying to reinvent the wheel when I have this nice Porsche here, hop in and see if it takes it and take a ride with me, you know, because <laughs> You know, so so I feel like sometimes the UFO community gets a little bit bogged down in in the 21st century mythology of this idea of extraterrestrials, which is not something that I'm entirely writing off the existence or their visitation. I just think that the abduction experience smells a lot like uh like like fairy lore to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, we we have the same problem here in the German speaking world um, that. Uh, um UFO community is uh yeah, let's call it by its name, it's very narrow minded. Uh they they um have to insist on their materialist views on uh yeah, ETH and nuts and bolts UFOs. Yes, exactly. I think I think it's this this adherence to materialism that the that is really sh- the UFO community is is shooting itself in the foot in a sense. Um it's it's interesting to me that they have no that the UFO community has no problem endorsing ideas. This is actually what my essay in the reframing the debate book was about. Mm-hmm. The UFO community has no problem addressing ideas that are very non-materialist, like uh, like telepathy, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, but they still want to force the UFO abduction phenomena into this materialist framework. It's almost <laughs> it's it's almost like uh, they aren't doing themselves any favors by trying to do that at all. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you could explain it in, or, or they are trying to explain it in a way like maybe it's technology that enables telepathy and stuff like that. So, yeah, who knows? Um, but we we have the same issue here, as, as Bernard said. I mean, especially in the German-speaking countries, we never really had a psychedelic culture. Uh, we never really mm. had uh, counterculture movements in that sense. So there's a lot of. I think we're still way behind uh, the Anglo- uh, Anglo-American uh, sphere. And, well, I'm not talking about others, but um, it is an issue. Um, yeah, and that's why we're talking to you. That's why we're trying to, to yeah, reframe the debate once more, especially <laughs> for, for our uh, people here. Um, let's see. I mean, there are, there are a lot of uh, language barriers in between the cultures. Um, there, are especially, uh, uh, German speaking, uh, people are quite narrow minded sometimes when it comes to English. So a lot of the mm. very, very famous or very, very, uh, broad, uh, ideas that came, came forward over the last, uh, decades in the, uh, uh, English speaking cultures around uh, consciousness and stuff it, it never really made it ha- had an impact in the in the in our uh, culture so to say because of the language barrier although uh, um, we learn English in in school and stuff but people still they don't they don't really like to listen to English speaking uh, uh, English English language podcasts and stuff like that. So it's like we're 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 doing our own stuff and uh, cooking our own soup, so to say. Um, yeah, and that's what what we are trying to break up a bit. So thanks for the chance to talk to you. Well, that's that's fascinating. I had never really considered uh, the lack of a sort of a counterculture movement um, in Germany. Although I I guarantee you that you know you mentioned that perhaps some German speakers are a little bit narrow minded about English. I I I have to I have to I can't I cannot imagine that anyone is more narrow minded about other languages than most Americans. But yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's a point of uh, perennial embarrassment that more of us aren't uh, b- bilingual. Yeah. Um, but that's what I, I know you, enough. You- you are you are not really bilingual. Uh, we we learn English in school from from a very young age, so we should be able to to break that language barrier. But we still don't really do it. Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Um, but yeah, it's 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 interesting. And, and and you know, I'm I'm not again, I'm not opposed to the idea that there might be a material extraterrestrial answer for some of these things. Yeah, um, neither you know, are we. Yeah. I'm. I, I, Looking at like you know some, someone that Gordon is a big champion of, um, John Brandenburg, who's who's that mm-hmm. it's highly likely that there might be there might be evidence for um, uh, nuclear attacks 
on Mars, on Mars taking a look yeah. at some of the isotopes on Mars, mm-hmm. which I mean, that's that's definitely that would definitely be an extraterrestrial material. You know, nuts and bolts, spacecraft, biological alien sort of, uh, sort of uh, event that happened in our, you know, in our in our universe's past. But mm-hmm. uh, I, th- I think that we're looking at, I think that we're sort of with the UFO phenomena and the abduction phenomena. I think we're sometimes conflating things. Um, I think that ninety percent of UFOs are probably explainable either by natural phenomena, misidentification, or you know, experimental aircraft. Um, there is that pernicious 10% that I think might be some sort of uh, consciousness phenomena. I don't know if you're familiar with the work of uh, Eric Wallet, um, but he is a uh, he is a French Canadian researcher who has a pretty sound uh, uh, proposal that perhaps a lot of UFOs are basically uh, poltergeist phenomena manifesting themselves at an almost cultural level. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that might be partially mm-hmm. that. Um, it might be some sort of spirit phenomena akin to the lights that were associated with the fairy folk or, you know, and I think that some of it might actually be extraterrestrial visitation, but I don't think that that necessarily always grafts onto the, onto the, uh, the abduction experience. And if you'd really take apart the abduction experience, I mean, the similarities between that and, and fairy lore are, you know, astounding, even in the, in, in, in some obvious ways, you know, the stature, both, you know, aliens are tend to be short in a lot of these encounters. Um, you know, the lights, uh, the wands that are sometimes seen by, uh, by, uh, abductees that are able to paralyze people. You know, that's exactly the same thing that would happen in a lot of this fairy lore. In fact, the, where we get the term stroke is from someone who was fairy struck or fairy touched. They exactly. were in a paralysis. Um, there's this motif of the fairy queen, which in a lot of these stories, you have the short fairies that are being supervised by a taller lady. Um, you'll see that in abduction experiences as well. A small gray is being supervised by a single taller gray alien. Um, levitation. You'll have, um, there's a phenomena that in the British Isles was called being pixie led, where people would just sort of find themselves wandering or they'd find themselves disoriented. Well, you know, where many people are often abducted from roadways where they find themselves driving down a road that they never thought they would. Um, you know, you have fairy rings, which are, you know, the circular rings of mushrooms, and you have crop circles <laughs> today. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you have both, you know, people talk about underground alien bases today. Well, the fairy fairyland was typically located underground. Um, you have a, a, a broad variety of different types of aliens that people talk about. Well, you know, if you look at the, uh, I always joke that if you look at the, uh, the fairy lore, it almost looks like a Pokemon <laughs> catalog of different creatures <laughs> and such. Yeah, um, or like the, the, the classic grimoires with, with all the... Yes. Exactly, uh, demon uh, races and 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 uh, the their positions in the hierarchy and so on. Yeah, it's- I, I would I would love to uh, a project that I would love to do, and I'm not sure. I keep on talking. But so I might end up doing it at some point. I keep on waiting for somebody else to do it, so I don't have to. Um, <laughs> is is to go through the grimoires and then go through a lot of these because if you look, well, are you familiar with um? He's taken it down, but are you familiar with Albert Rosales's humanoid index that he compiled? I'm um, not exactly I, sure. Not sure. I, I, think, I think I know what you mean, but I'm not sure if it's the same thing. Yeah, same for me. Here. There was a gentleman uh, by the name of Albert Rosales who, who compiled like basically every single uh, humanoid encounter that he could get his hands on. Um, he, and he organized it by decade. And he has since unfortunately taken it down because a lot of people were copying it and pasting it. And he's actually starting to put them into, he's sort of starting to uh, put them into books, but by putting them into books, he, uh, he naturally has to really uh, pare down a lot of what he's looked at. But if you're to look at sort of what Albert had, which I have, I made it a point to save for my own personal use before he took it down. Um, if you look at what Robert had compiled, it's not, people are not always seeing, you know, little gray aliens, yeah. especially in you know UFO encounters. Um, setting aside stuff like cryptozoology and just like the weird stuff, people are seeing in these alien encounters really bizarre stuff. One of uh, my friend, Greg Bishop, the famous, uh, his favorite that he always talked about, the encounter that Rosales uh, compiled, was a report of uh, these aliens who looked like giant bananas covered in beige terry cloth, like a like a bathrobe. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Which, you know, which again, like it's, it's, it, I, I would love to see, so the project that I'm alluding to is I would love to see someone go through the grimoires and take a look and see if they're, t- take a look with the grimoires in one hand and Albert's index in the other hand, and to really look through and see if they can find a comparison for a lot of these grimoiric spirits and entities in these, you know, vastly um, varied accounts that Albert put together. Um, 
No, that would be a, that would be a fun project. It sounds a little daunting, so I'm not sure that I. <laughs> I'm not sure that I want to do it, but um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I yeah. Think it, it, Gordon sounds like the kind of guy to to talk with. The... Yeah, I think I think he would he would definitely have some insight. Um, I have a good friend, uh, Rin Collier. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Um, and uh, Rin is Rin, Rin's uh, Rin's uh, much more into the occult than I am, so I keep on trying to push him into that into doing that project, but I don't know if he will. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in, in in both alien lore and in fairy lore, you see this, and in, in the grimoires, like we said. You'll see this giant um, variety of, of creatures that are mentioned. Um, you know, livestock mutilation was blamed on fairies at one point. Now we mm -hmm. blame it on extraterrestrials. There's the missing time component. You know, people go into fairy rings for what they feel like are five minutes, and they've been there for five years. Similarly, people will be abducted, or they'll come. They'll they'll first realize that they've had an abduction experience because the drive that should have taken them 30 minutes ended up taking five hours. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you have child abduction. I, I'm really fascinated by. Um, by the comparison, because I suspect, I won't say for certain, but I suspect that you can take any aspect of alien lore and unpack it, find a, a precedent in fairy lore. Um, one th and and I've, I've only recently come to terms with, uh, with uh, something that I thought was an outlier, but actually it's not. I was wondering to myself, I was wondering whether or not there was a precedent in fairy lore for something like alien implants. And I really couldn't think of a good comparison until I realized that there was a phenomena called being uh, fair, the, the fairy blast. You were, you were hit with the fairy blast. Are either of you familiar with this? Um, no, not really. Yeah. No, never heard of that. No. Uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed because I, like you, I love the, the Celtic stories and, and uh, I've grown up here and no, I've never heard of it. No, no, no worries, because actually I, I, I had sort of heard of it here and there, but I didn't, didn't realize how deep uh, this particular topic was. Um, the fairy blast was usually depicted as a, a foreign object in people's bodies, um, sometimes a, a sort of similar to a tumor. Um, it was uh, first documented, of course, in the, of course, in the, uh, the uh, British Isles um, by uh, people like uh, Crofton Croker who wrote a great book on Celtic mythology and uh, this particular belief um, of the fairy blast where the fairies would actually punish you by putting some sort of uh, debris in your body um, found its way over to uh, Newfoundland mm -hmm. where there actually is a pretty robust fairy tradition. Um, there are accounts in Newfoundland, Newfoundland of people uh, going to doctors to have their fairy blast operated on and the doctor will actually start removing splinters of wood and little bit, bits of grass and whatnot, basically detritus. Wow. Um, uh, similarly, there was a, another account that I found where um, someone uh, had a fairy blast that was appearing as a boil and uh, when it was lanced, uh, there was a long string that they pulled out of the, of the wound. So obviously oh. you can see how that compares to, to alien implants and this idea of a foreign object being put into your body by these, this other, the other, as you, as you guys uh, referred to it before we, before we started talking, um, which is a term that I really love the other. Um, but also, you know, it's interesting. People have wanted, are you familiar with uh, Morgellons disease? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I, I, th I find that, 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 that account of the person who had their fairy blast lance and had the, had a string coming out of it sounds awfully sounds similar to like Morgellons it. disease. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting that people have tried to tie, um, Morgellons disease, which <laughs> I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if it's a real thing or not. I'm, I don't know enough about it, honestly, yeah. but, um, I find it interesting that people have tried to, uh, tie, um, the, uh, the, the Morgellons disease in with aliens and you have a Morgellon like affliction in the fairy blast. So I'm after I experienced that little point of comparison, I, I really do feel confident in saying that you can take apart almost any aspect of, of the alien UFO lore and you will find a, a parallel in fairy lore, mm -hmm. which again, I'm not saying that uh, aliens are fairies or fairies are aliens. I'm saying that there is a similar, you know, again, you use that term, a similar shared other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A similar and story in a way, yeah. An underlying yeah, yeah, exactly. story. Mm -hmm. yeah. there's, there's also one aspect you didn't mention, um, the erotic encounter. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, um, well, you know, the, 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 the erotic encounter and also, you know, these notions of hybridity. Um, which and changelings. <laughs> probably, yep. yeah, yeah, I was about to say, probably part of the reason I didn't talk about it is because half my book talks about changelings. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so, yeah, so basically, my, this, this, the, the, the new book that I, that will be coming out later this year was my 
attempt to sit down and try to be intellectually honest with myself because I personally have never really put a lot of stock into tales of alien human hybrids for whatever reason. Um, I guess it's just my skeptical side. At the same time, I believe that a lot of the witnesses are being truthful and I believe that uh, there is something objective and real happening here. So how, so I, I sat down with myself and said, how do I wrestle with this idea that people are reporting this thing that I think is I, I don't think there's a real strong basis to, and 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 the way that I was able to sort of reinterpret that is to look at it through again the the, the idea of the changeling. Um, so a lot of these baby presentations that people will have when they've uh, allegedly ha- had their hybrid children presented to them by these aliens, uh, the descriptions of these hybrid babies sound almost exactly like descriptions of changelings, where the fairies would exchange your child for one of the sick fairy babies. Um, Similarly, you know, talking about hybridity, there are plenty of accounts of of uh, human beings, um, you know, having uh, sexual relations with the fairy folk, uh, just like humans have sexual relations with uh, aliens, uh, bearing their, you know, half human, half fairy children. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's it's I think that honestly, if you look at the work of someone like uh, someone like uh, Jeff Crample, exactly, uh, uh I think that uh, the sexual component is one of the one of the there's there's something about understanding this phenomena this phenomena uh, something about it is tied to sexuality and I think that's an important key uh, that a lot of people try to miss when they ignore that um, something about something about sexuality is so much more powerful than I think we realize. As, as as human beings, mm-hmm. um, yeah, that's also uh, it, it's well, um, how should I say it? Uh, yeah, it's a huge concept, you know, the whole uh, tantric, and I'm not really talking about the new yes, tantric mm-hmm. traditions, but the original tantric t- traditions, also the tie into uh, alchemy, um, that finally all together tie together in experiences like Whitley Strieber's uh, encounters, uh, where he's also fighting his own. Uh, Christian beliefs and and taboos in a way and is confronted with them um, and yeah and yeah. the whole uh, actually, symbiosis uh, uh, aspect of psychedelic encounters uh, there's something huge and uh, sacred uh, beyond something we're a- currently able to understand I think yeah you you, you touched on something there too uh, which I think is is hugely important is this idea of you know alchemy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, the prevailing knowledge is that alchemy isn't real. But I think every time, every time a human life is created, I mean, that's that's alchemy. That's right form there, of alchemy yeah. in a way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, I think that uh, I, I think that uh, that's that's a, that's, a, that's an excellent point that that you're touching on. And and when I say you know sexuality being powerful, I'm not being prudish about it. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, um, but but uh, I think that there is um there's some there's some sort of untapped power that has something to do with this otherness that we that we that we talk about i think uh, for me i mean well let, let's go a bit astray for me i think uh, the it is a symbol in the end for um for uh for a symbiosis between us and the other whatever it is and uh, if it even is the other or if it's just another as- aspect of ourselves uh, whatever um but I think it's it's just a, 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 a reflection in a way that whatever you do uh, on the other side uh, when you enter hyperspace or, what, or a different trance states or looking into space, going into space, um, it's it's in the end always the same story. It's it's us encountering the other, meeting the other, um, trying to balance each other out, trying to fight each other, trying to, being afraid of each other. Um, it's like an, an encounter with a wild animal, and both of you are, are not are not really aware of the other. I think we are the other for whatever it is out there. So I think there might be they might have sa- have the same issues in a way. Um, yeah. It, it, what, what you what you say is, uh, reminds me of uh, Jeff Kripal's, um description of the the numinous as um, um, reading us as we are reading it, and this this sort of ouroboric structure. Exactly. Yeah. And and um, in alchemy, the the goal is the the hieros gamos, the um, meeting of the opposites. Mm-hmm. You know, there are these beautiful depictions of uh, this. Um, 
person uh, that is both male and female mm -hmm. and uh, has become one. And mm -hmm. for, in, in my understanding, you know, this um, spirituality, creativity and sexuality, they are one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. They maybe they, they express yeah, each other excellent. in a different way, but they are the, one and the same. Yeah, that's that's an excellent excellent point that I don't think can be uh, can be emphasized enough. I mean, if you look at, you know, I'm warming up to the idea that a lot of these entities that we encounter are psychopomps. Mm -hmm. The idea that there are they are entities that are um, basically interceding on the behalf of an even greater other of some sort um, in human affairs. They're, you know, sort of guiding us uh, on, on the astral level. Um, but if you look at us, I mean, we kind of have the same thing in shamanic cultures. We have, uh, you know, if, 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 if the, uh, this concept of psychopomps are entities from this other realm uh, interceding uh, on their, on the, on the, on their behalf in the human realm, um, we have, you know, on, on our end, we have shamans who are interceding in the spirit, or the, I say spirit, uh, yep. for lack of a better term, but inter, in, intervening in the, uh, the 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 other realm on the behalf of humans. And I think that you know that that, that parallelism there is exactly sort of getting to what to what you were talking about the idea that uh, that we might be as anomalous uh, to the other as the other is to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Uh, it was a uh, Laird Scranton, I believe, uh, was talking about. Um, the belief of the supernatural in the Dogon tribe of Africa and how the Dogon believe that uh, these, these worlds are basically, well, are more or less the same. Mm -hmm. um, but um, the human world has uh, endless ability to act and incomplete knowledge. And the mm -hmm. other world has, you know, uh, has, has complete knowledge, but an inability to act. Exactly. And so we're actually using each other for our, own purposes to try to make some sort of completed uh, completed reality. I, I like this very much. This uh, notion of, of a co-creation. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, and that's um, you know if you look at sort of this idea, which is getting a lot of <clears throat> a lot of discussion now uh, because of the work of my friend Greg Bishop. Uh, uh, um, if you look at sort of the 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 uh, the origins of that idea, you can find some antecedents to it. Uh, in UFO discussion, as far back as the uh, the early '90s, I believe um, there was an Ann Druffel article in uh, either Lucian Journal or a Flying Saucer Review issue. Can't recall which, but uh, she was sort of talking about similar ideas, and Greg has taken that idea and really gone with it. The idea that uh, perhaps you know, perhaps part of what we experience is coming directly from us, which ties into bigger ideas that I can't quite grasp, like. Uh, like uh, information theory, which is a theory of mm -hmm. interpreting reality, which I again I can't I can't speak too much because it's 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 a little bit above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I think that there's I think that there's something really um, really important in that. And again, coming back to you know this idea of the the UFO community, nobody for the most part really wants to talk about these sort of things because they're stuck on some of these really kind of quaint ideas about what the phenomena is and how it manifests itself in sort of this 1950s B sci-fi movie sort of way. And I think that these ideas are not only more elegant um, and perhaps more, uh, more objectively helpful, um, but I just think they're more interesting too. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, uh, you, you, you just, uh, before you, you, uh, mentioned, I think it was in the context of the Dogon tribe that they basically mm -hmm. think that it's it's the the same space we share in a way. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And when I when I go, I mean, I'm, we are we are magicians uh, in a way uh, and do quite a lot of stuff and uh, do remote viewing sessions and out of body travels and whatever. Uh, so when I go out there. Um, it basically feels like an ocean. So it's it's everyone swimming in the same ocean and there are sharks and there are whales and there are dolphins. And just because you cannot see the whale because you have you put on specific goggles that filter out uh, realities in a way or that focus your uh, perception in a way towards this very, very uh, solid uh, reality in a way, um, the shark is still out there. Just because you cannot see it and you cannot perceive it doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, and the other way around, 
Um, so that, I think that's the, for me, that's the best picture I can come up with that it's, that we, we are all sharing the same ocean. We're just looking into different directions and having different goggles on and filtering out different uh, aspects of it. But in the end, it's just the same reality. And we might go there uh, later when we talk about, uh, out of body experiences and psychedelics and stuff. Uh, but just, yeah, as a heads up, so to say. Yeah, that's that's an excellent analogy. Um, and again, it's I think it's I think it's really powerful and quite apt. Um, it's this idea that even <laughs> you know, uh, even if you don't believe in these things, these things believe in you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. you know? At least, you if like, you, uh, when you start to bleed, uh, you will you will get in touch with the shark. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Even if you don't believe in it, yeah. and, the, and and having having on these filters might protect you from most of the sharks because you have no reason to panic because you don't perceive the sharks and sharks tend to react to panicking people uh, in a way. So having these blinders on might might be some kind of a protection. Just yeah. Well, yeah, well put. Mm. Well put. Very well put. <laughs> yeah. Um, you don't, you don't have that's well this comes back to something that i'm always uh, astounded at whenever i talk to folks who are intensely skeptical of this sort of thing in in, in, the, in america at least i always tell them i say you know I, I know that you don't believe in this but you've paid for it <laughs> you know your tax dollars have gone to fund exactly. people <laughs> who, who who believe in these things you know um and and you know people want to talk about psychic spies in america and things being uh being a relic of the cold war era but i'm i guarantee you that similar stuff is still going on uh, yeah, sure. in some in some form or fashion and so we're all paying for this even if we don't believe in it you know as as, as americans um, it's 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 the same in in austria here um i'm i know it uh, for a fact because i've interviewed a former um intelligence guy um, and he told me about this. He he just bluntly said, "Yeah, of course, we we are using this stuff." Mm -hmm. And well, uh, you know, it's, you know, it, it, you know it uh, works. It works. You know? sure. Yeah. So it's um, you know, we we get a lot of um, um, mails and, and and personal requests. So uh, could you prove that to us? Could you could you do that and uh, and so on. It's just no. Uh, <laughs> I I'm not interested in it anymore. <laughs> Go I, out and learn it yourself. Have, <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah, don't yeah, have yeah, the, exactly. I don't have the time. Uh, I I just it's not a matter um, if it works. It just uh, what do we do with it? Well, mm. yeah. I mean, it's it's uh, to 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 steal a page out of Gordon's book. Um, you know. I don't have to prove anything to you. Go grab a Ouija board and go to an abandoned building, yeah, <laughs> you know, exactly. abandoned mental hospital. <laughs> yeah, or and drop five grams out, dried. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, or yeah, or yeah, five grams and five dry grams in silent darkness, as Terrence McKenna used to say. <laughs> um, you know, this is this stuff's out there for you. Um, you know, you might have to do it a couple of times before you have that experience, uh, because you know, the uh, this sort of thing doesn't uh, isn't exactly on call, but mm -hmm. of experiences available to you it's always funny the people who are really skeptical about the efficacy of magic are never people who have ever tried uh mm. to do any sort of magical practice at all they just sit back you know from the uh they sit back from fr from the from the discussion and they sort of poo poo it but they never roll up their sleeves and you know get deep into it yeah especially not going deep into it and i know some people who are like have dabbled around and nothing really happened or they didn't really perceive anything because most of them expected something spectacular to happen like pu like pushing the button on a machine and something uh, popping up in their in their apartment uh, and it's that's not really how magic works most of the time um so it's uh getting your hand uh, your head around it and uh like again like like uh, gordon's uh paragraph we, we talked in the beginning like you have to flip the your whole worldview uh, around and you have to rethink so many things and so many new implications come from that and there's so many uh, yeah yeah like jeffrey greipel uh, calls it losing worldviews, uh, at least having to lose two worldviews. It's one of my, my favorite quotes uh, from him. But uh, yeah, people who dive into magic and like keep pushing in a way, uh, once they break through, then it's, yeah, 
you you cannot unsee it in the end. Uh, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, and, and and the other thing that I always find interesting is people, you know, people get upset when you suggest that perhaps all of this stuff is human centric. And in other words, the idea that perhaps all of this is some sort of archetypal made archetypal uh, projection of mm -hmm. the human unconsciousness made manifest or that we, you know, we are, we are the other in a sense. People get really upset about that, but as if that's, as if that's any less astounding, you know, I <laughs> exactly. think that's just as fascinating, you know, um, if not even more fascinating. Yeah, ex ex yeah, exactly. And it, it, it just, I, I do feel like there is an objective reality to this. I just don't know what it is. Um, but yeah, it's, it, but it's, it, but whatever it is, is, I feel like it's really important. It's, it, it boggles the mind that people don't. I mean, if people were to try this, this could be something that changes your life. Yeah, <laughs> um, changes I mean, society and reality in the end. Yeah, that's, yeah, I, that's exactly. what I what what I talked with uh, Jeff Kripal about. I, I met him uh, two months ago, and I asked him about the function of the paranormal, and. Uh, this is what, what he said in a nutshell. It's uh, breaking up our notion of a fixed objective world. Hmm. The, the, yeah, the that's, paranormal that's... is... <laughs> yeah, it, the, the, all the, and it takes on the form of stories. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to say that's a really good... Uh, yeah. I was, I was going to say that's a really good point, really well said, but of course it's really well said. It's coming from Jeff Cryer. Jeff, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that, uh, it exists to be destabilizing, um, uh, which I mean, which of course is the reason why you don't have very good results. I won't say you don't have any results because there's plenty of sci phenomena that's been, mm -hmm. been, uh, been investigated this way, but you don't have very good results in the laboratory setting is because mm -hmm. you're trying to, you're trying to measure something that does the exact opposite of the protocols that you're trying to enforce. Exactly, you know, yeah. You're, you're, yeah. It's like saying, it's like saying, I'm going to measure, uh, I'm going to go measure the fluid dynamics of water in the desert. Like it's, <laughs> you're in the <laughs> wrong spot for it. It's not going to work. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm well excited about Dean Radin's upcoming book about magic. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I'm quite excited about that. He's someone who is, uh, Fighting the good fight, as yes. it were, um, and uh, I'm a big admirer of his work. I have not. Is it out yet? I, I'm not uh, sure. No, I'm no in, in a few in days, a few weeks I think. or something. Yeah. Okay, the yeah, tenth of I'm, April. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. And speaking about uh, personal experiences uh, and and rolling up your sleeves, uh, Joshua, what are your experiences with the other? Uh, you know, it's 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 interesting because I feel like you talk to people. And generally, they'll say, I haven't had any, you know, I don't I haven't had any experiences with the supernatural or anything. And if you pick at that scab a little bit more, <laughs> people usually have had experiences that they don't realize. Um, in fact, I would argue that there's probably things that happen to us once or twice a day that we can write off as being mundane. So we do write off as being mundane. Um, so similarly, I, I, I normally think of myself as someone who hasn't had a lot of experiences, but um, there have been some genuinely... Uh, anomalous things in my life. Uh, the earliest thing that I can remember is that my parents were uh, working on uh, at, in a, a new addition to their home. And uh, during that time in particular, um, but uh, it happened on a little bit either side of it before and after, um, my mother and I would find stacks of four quarters uh, in the most odd places. Um, I remember one in particular, we found a stack of four quarters uh, behind this giant dictionary. This dictionary is about six inches thick, seven inches thick. Um, we found a, a stack of four quarters just sitting back there. Um, we would find them basically in out of the way places that we hadn't looked or hadn't needed anything for years, like the top shelf of a closet, you know, again, this, this stack of four quarters all during this period of my life, which sounds a little bit like guys phenomena. It sounds a little bit like sort of, you know, fairy phenomena. Um, mm -hmm. Again, the the fact that this was centered around the addition to a house, that's a liminal state right there. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a state of flux. It's a state of transition. Um, so that's sort of the earliest thing I can remember. There's been some little things that have happened here and there. Um, but uh, the most profound things that have happened to me are, are two events that I would say are pretty much more or less ghost encounters. Um, 
the first one was at the uh, home of uh, the Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. We were doing a sort of little history travel vacation uh, with my father, who was a big Civil War history buff. And uh, we went to visit Stonewall Jackson's home, which during the uh, American Civil War was used as a hospital uh, for the Confederacy. And I recall very distinctly that there was a narrow um, a stairway, very narrow. Um, somebody my size almost had to turn sideways to get through it um, <laughs> because I, I, I have pretty big shoulders. Um, but because it was so narrow, it meant that it was single file. And the group, the tour group, um, that was going to come down had to wait at the top of the stairs for this, for the next group to come up before they could come down. So uh, my group uh, reached the top of the stairs and I looked uh, to my left um, into the crowd and there was a boy who was taller than anyone else um, who uh, I can still see him very distinctly. He was wearing a Confederate uh, uniform. Uh, he looked to be a, uh, in his late teens, which would have been somebody who could have been enlisted at the time uh, because a lot of those people, especially in the Confederacy were no more than no more than boys. Um, Mm -hmm. And he had, he had these sunken cheekbones and he was looking straight at me. And of course I didn't think anything of it. There are people who do reenactions and Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I thought, at first, like maybe he was just a kid who was a, a real big fan of, of history and he was just wearing, you know, a, a recreated, uh, recreated uniform. Um, but I, 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 uh, walked up to him. He, he was really into it. Wasn't he? He seemed to be really enjoying himself in his uniform and no, one, including my mother and I had, had seen the boy. Um, and I <laughs> asked, uh, the uh, ladies who sold tickets, uh, to the to the uh, historical site, whether or not anyone had come in dressed like that, and no one had all day. Um, so it was interesting to me that you know it's I, I've <laughs> it's interesting because you know I, I always thought that when you see a ghost, it's going to be like oh I saw a ghost, you know. You scared, <laughs> but it, was, it was so mundane to me. I I, get, I looked at it afterwards and I'm like huh, I guess I saw a ghost. Um, yeah, yeah. The, the other the other sort of set of events that that happened to me. Um, I sort of went out looking for myself, um, which is sort of getting to that thing that, that Gordon talks about, you know, go out and find a way uh, to have your own experience. Um, I went to uh, Waverly Hills sanitarium sanitor- sanitarium in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, uh, which uh, at the height of the tuberculosis epidemic had a death rate that averaged one patient per hour. 24 hours a day. Okay. Um, it is claimed to be the site of the largest unmarked grave in America. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but uh, at the time it was vacant, um, privately owned, but they would bring, they would bring groups in there. And I was dating a girl who was, uh, who was part of a ghost hunting group. And actually looking back on it, a pretty competent group, you know, most of the time, uh, you know, ghost hunters run around like idiots, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, but uh, these are some pretty competent, pretty competent people. Um, I experienced explained light phenomena, um, uh, around corn. It just it looked like just beyond certain corners of the, of the interior. It looked like someone had a TV on that sort of blue, mm-hmm. blue, white glow. And then we'll the corner, there'll be nothing there. We would get on the walkie talkies. No one else was on our floor. Um, my girlfriend experienced uh, some phenomena that I found out later is because uh, not I, she and I didn't do any research going into it, but she experienced some phenomena that uh, that is quite common. Um, this 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 figure that uh, that slinks along the floor and rushes towards you. Um, we found that was actually something that people encounter a good deal. She saw that. I didn't see it. Um, the most profound thing that happened to me. Um, well, two things actually. The first one was uh, in the kitchen area. Um, it felt as though I had gotten a uh, need in the testicles all of a sudden, like this, you know, that sort of pit of your stomach, sick feeling. Um, and then, you know, as soon as I walked out of the kitchen, I felt fine. Now that could be, you know, that could be various things. It could be environmental things. The, but hands down, the, the most profound thing that happened to me was um, was coming up against a large metal door because these were these heavy metal doors on the interior, heavy metal door leading to the stairwell. And at this point, I was sort of being a bit flippant about it all, um, uh, because I mean, not because I didn't believe in this stuff, but because you know, I just 
I guess it was a defense mechanism, but I was saying something really, really, uh, really petty, <laughs> I think. And as I walk up to the store, it goes from being completely shut to slamming open. So completely shut to like the, the, the door actually ended up hitting the wall. Um, okay. It basically slammed open in my face. Um, giant racket. You know, so loud. It was, it was, imagine a door opening as if someone kicked it from the other side. That's exactly what happened. Um, and that was our exit. So we had to go down that <laughs> and there was nobody <laughs> behind it. Um, but that was, that was a moment that I, I cannot explain, you know, uh, you know, I guess if you want to be really skeptical, you could say that, um, you know, the, the owners of the property installed some sort of pneumatic, pneumatic, uh, uh, pneumatic, tube or something that would force the door (laughs) yeah 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 exactly but you know i i just don't i mean if if you could see this place it's in such a state of disrepair they've actually been trying to sell it for a while i don't think that that's what happened so those are my really those, those have been my really profound moments in addition to you know these strange synchronicities that i've had i had i had a a synchronicity that was that was actually a pretty wild rapid uh, series of events. I was same girlfriend at the time, right? Same girlfriend I was dating and it was towards the end of the relationship. And I was suspecting that we were going to break up and it was really, you know, I didn't want, I didn't want it to end, but she was being distant and I was really concerned. I was on a plane coming back uh, from a gig in Austin. And, uh, over the course of 30 seconds, I would say the following things happen. Okay. So she was an oboe player. Um, who did her undergraduate work in Cincinnati, Ohio. And her name um, was, uh, let's just say her name was um, uh, Whitney Jackson. Okay. The name was Whitney Jackson. Whitney Jackson, the elbow player who went to school in Cincinnati. Over the course of 30 seconds, the crossword puzzle that I was working on had a solution of oboe. The gentleman in front of me dropped his ticket, which was to Cincinnati. And as he turns around, to ask me if I can pick up his ticket, he has the names of his kids tattooed on his forearms, Whitney and Jackson. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> Which, and, and, you know, uh, this will be a better story if, if everything about the relationship, uh, you know, <laughs> panned out in a, in a positive way. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, I think that if, if, if you could ascribe some sort of meaning to that, it was just saying, stop freaking out okay or you know or it was my uh psychic anxiety that was sort of manifested this synchronicity but that's by far the most profound synchronicity that i've ever had and that's just you know people like to say oh that's chance or oh that's um that's uh that's random but when things reach a level of magnitude like that you you uh, random chance is a poor poor explanation for it it because the odds are not an explanation that's <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> so so I'd, I'd say that those are probably the most profound things again you know little things here and there um have happened to me those m- minor precognitive things but uh, for the most part i don't consider myself i consider myself as psychically dead as a doornail <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know that from somewhere <laughs> uh yeah, but I I think it um, is fascinating that you described uh, your reaction as just so normal. Mm-hmm. Well, and, not, uh, I, well, the the reaction to the door slamming in my face, I screamed like a girl. I'm surprised that I didn't pee okay. myself. You know? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that was that was intense. That was intense. Um, and you know, it's one of those. That really was a a a, a toothpaste doesn't go back in the tube. Uh, sort of, sort of moment. I mean, I remember coming home exhausted at 7 a.m. back to where we were staying, mm-hmm. and laying there in bed, not being able to get back to sleep because this was. I mean, this was even though I'd had the uh, the Civil War ghost experience before this. This this was in your face. You can't deny that this happened. Uh, and of course, as the years go on, you, you sort of look back on it like, did that really happen? But this was a profound moment, a really profound moment. Um, but yeah, th- yeah, I-, I kept my cool in the-, the other things, but not when I was in a haunted, uh, haunted building. That was <laughs> that was a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, but normally for me, it's um, I-, I like it when it uh, when it's spooky, and uh, I- I'm you know I-, I grew up with these things. I grew up in a family tradition, and uh, so for me, this is all quite normal, you know. 
But uh, there was one moment I had uh, that was really, really, really spooky, and it had to do with fairies. Yeah. Really? Okay, I, w- I want to hear this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I suppose it was fairies. Um, um, it was uh, several years ago um, on a elongated weekend. Um, we did um, uh, sweat lodges. Um, there's a group that that's very uh, traditional. Um, they they learned the ceremonies from um, Archifier Lame Deer, whom you might know. He's, um, uh, I think he, he died in 2001, uh, mm-hmm. a great Lakota chief. And um, yeah, he, he founded some places where, where they do sweat lodges very traditionally in the, in the Lakota tr- uh, way all over the world. And, and there's one here in Austria too. And um, a friend of mine um, underwent um, um, Amblechia, yeah, it's called in Lakota, um, the um, vision, vision quest, quest. basically. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah you know, the, where, you, where you're out uh, four days and four nights um, without eating and drinking and uh, mm-hmm. just, just be there in nature and praying and so on. And um, uh, it is required that uh, every Everybody who goes on a vision quest has um, one or two or three persons that uh, stay in camp and pray for him and eat for him and so on. And I was one of them. And uh, during the course of this weekend, uh, we did sweat lodges and um, yeah, the, the fireplace um, there uh, had to be guarded because the fire isn't supposed to go out. So it, it can burn down, uh, but uh, it, it mustn't go out and uh, the third night i had the feeling yeah it's up to me to to guard the fire and to be there and and uh, to feed it some some wood so that it kept burning and um interestingly enough it was the night uh, from 12th of june to 21th of june so mid, not not exactly midsummer's night but the, the night before that and pretty you know, close, yeah. Pretty yeah, close. yeah. It's it's closely associated with fairy lore this this night. Um, so I sat there with a friend, um, and it was early morning. You know, the the moon was um, was not to be seen anymore, but the sun hadn't come up, and the, the birds had um, not yet begun to sing. So it was also this. You know, uh, threshold, um, the liminal, uh, mm. yeah, yeah, not, not quite dawn yet. Mm. Um, it was dark and, um, yeah, we, we just, yeah, you know, uh, we didn't talk anymore. We just, uh, looked in the, in the embers and mm-hmm. suddenly I realized there was singing in the air. I, I hadn't realized. When it had begun, I just realized, oh, I'm listening to some singing. It was just just below the the, um, the threshold where you, where you can hear. You know, it was very very um, faint subtle, and right? it was very subtle, very subtle, but very distinct. It was um, there were no words, at least that I couldn't discern, but um, they were very. You know, a- ethereal singing, and um, like you know, this this uh, elvish kind of singing, this this um, silver tones, this, um, and at first I thought, oh, that's um, you know, a, a trick of of the ear. Um, there was a um, a brook gurgling behind us, and maybe oh, I, no. No, no, I could hear the brook and I could hear the singing. And I thought maybe, yeah, there are some people camping over there, but no, it's not coming from over there. It came from um, behind us, from the mountain. It came down the mountain and it came nearer. And that's the moment when I thought, oh my God, <laughs> that is so creepy. And then I asked uh, the friend who was sitting beside me, do you hear that singing also? And he like jumped out of his skin and he said, you hear this too. And we, we were listening to it for a few minutes and then we, we couldn't. So when it, now, now it has ended. It, 
just sometimes yeah it, it faded out we didn't hear it then yeah it faded out we we couldn't discern the moment when it ended wow so so it, it uh it was all music right and um, uh and is there anything is there anything even comparable uh to what you uh to what you heard i no. mean have you ever heard anything like it wow no no not ever the story yeah, isn't even was... finished yet <laughs> yeah it gets creepier <laughs> um, oh jeez okay <laughs> yeah there was great uh, this, this friend who was on his wishing quest um, about half a year later, we talked about it because you're not supposed to talk about the, the time you, you have there. You, you, um, you're supposed to, to go with it for yourself. And, but, but half a year later, we talked about it and I told him about the singing we heard and he just looked at me and said, tell me what night was that? And I said, yeah, it was your third night up on the mountain. And I said, no, no, <laughs> no way. Because he was sitting there this night, he uh, he kept awake, and um, he um, he had his back against a big rock, mm. and he was praying, meditating, something like that. He had a, a knife that someone had forged for him for, for this ceremony, and he held it in his hand. And suddenly, there were myriads of, um, how do you call them, the little insects uh, that, that light up. Oh, uh, uh, fireflies? Or? Fireflies, yeah. Yeah, I think I think so. And uh, out of nowhere, myriads of them, and then he heard the singing. And mind you, we were kilometers away, and it was exactly the same singing. And it came from out of the rock he was leaning against. And that he is had fascinating. Yeah, he he told me he had the feeling like the surface of the rock softened, and he had to to strain that he didn't, um, you know, fall over and, and fall into the rock. And it was so alluring and, and, uh, the same feeling I had, you know, this, this, uh, come to us, come to us. Um, it's beautiful here. This, this, um, uh, siren call. And he said, yeah, he wanted to go there, but uh, he had to think of his family. And, and uh, so we just concentrated on the knife because, you know, fairies don't like iron. And say, yeah, mm -hmm. I want to go with you, but, but you know, I have to take care of my family and, and so on. And after a few minutes, it stopped. And it was, yeah, exactly the same time. It was sometime before dawn and uh, the same kind of thing. We just looked at each other and said, oh, whoa. <laughs> what did we hear there? Wow, that is amazing. Now I, I'm trying to recall because I believe that I believe that there have been um, fairy firefly connections, not just anomalous lights, but actually a specific connection with fireflies. Although I can't recall exactly what it was off the top of my head, but I have I have heard some sort of connection there. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. I, sometimes I experience it when 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 I'm out in the woods with friends uh, or with. Uh, yeah, uh, friends. Uh, do well, you mean? Uh, hmm? No, I, I was just going to say that everything that you that you said definitely lines up. I mean, the uh, the disembodied music that can't be recreated. Uh, you know, yeah. um, the, the 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 positioning of it or around Midsummer's Night. Um, uh, that's 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 a that's a fascinating story. Um, there was a uh, a. Fairy census that just came out was released by the Fairy Investigation Society. Um, yep. Yeah, Simon, yeah, we um, talked about uh, it in our show. Yeah, okay, yeah, fairies. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I hate that 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 your account didn't make it into that because that's a, that's a great story. <laughs> that's a great story. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I wish, I wish that I could, I wish that I could have an experience like that again um you know i know that i know that it's sort of a dangerous thing to say that you wish mm -hmm. these <laughs> wish yeah. these things about yourself <laughs> exactly. but um but you know i uh i i feel like it's been long enough because i mean i had my last really profound experience uh this was probably seven years ago now eight years ago okay. um so I'm, I'm ready for something else profound but i don't you know i don't want to I don't want to go in. I don't want to dive in with the shark, so I don't really know what to do. <laughs> I just, I'm just waiting. I'm just waiting for a shark to swim by. How about that? And say hello. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, you're you're very very welcome to visit us here. You know, uh, we have some very um, great hotspots in our area. Yeah, like really in, just around the corner, like and with within an hour travel, we have a lot of crazy uh, areas. We have uh, UFO hotspots. We have uh, basically the whole area, our whole country is uh, there are subterranean tunnels. Um, uh, you might have read about them in in uh, Gordon White's starships. Um, yeah, he he mentions it shortly. Uh, there's a um, oh, really Austrian professor called Heinz Kusch. And he uh, examines them. He's uh, from the University of our town in Graz, and he um, is an, an, a speleologist. Uh, that means he he experience uh, he um, researches um, tunnels, uh, man-made tunnels and, and natural tunnels. But he specializes in uh, cult caves. And uh, yeah, we've got subterranean tunnels here that are. Um, not natural that date back up to 20,000 years. Oh, wow. No, I, yeah. I, 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 I don't recall that off the top of my head from starships, but uh, that yeah, he just mentions it briefly, uh, very briefly. Yeah. Um, and uh, I've been in them. It's, it's amazing. Mm. And you know, this is, this is Celtic country here. Mm. Um, you know, uh, the Hallstatt culture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, that's in, in Austria. God, um, yeah, well, I mean, that's, that's definitely a place that's on my bucket list. So, um, yeah, come here and we'll uh, drive with you to Knittelfeld. That's, um, that's a small, a really small town um, uh, near, very near where I grew up, and one of the biggest UFO hotspots in Europe. It has some oh, elements yeah. of the of the Skinwalker Ranch from what you experienced there. So, yeah, right, right. So it's sort of a sort of a little bit like a window sort of. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. And we had some very strange experiences there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, <wow>. not, <laughs> not so strange, yeah, but <laughs> straight out scary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I we're, think we're it, just scared. <laughs> yeah, that I've scared me shit. In, <laughs> I've looked for places in the American Southeast, and I just don't think that there are that many um, for whatever reason. Yeah, um, I think it's. Yeah, uh, even though. Sorry, go ahead. A lot of uh, um, uh, 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 holy uh, holy areas. Uh, is it holy? Um, like a sacred, sacred areas, like uh, from natives uh, all around, uh, like the Celts here in in Austria, or the the American natives uh, around uh, the United States. Um, so I think that it is connected in a way. So they they knew where those places were, so to say, where the right. where the windows are or the <laughs> The curtains are quite uh, open. Yeah. Well, you know, when you when you think about, it's, it's, I always find it really interesting. This is something that uh, Peter Lavenda sort of talked about a little bit, but um, mm. you know, it's interesting. People are always, you know, you can there can be one murder that's been committed in a in a house, and oh no, now it's haunted. But when you consider the 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 amount of people, yeah, uh, who are always, you know. Pushed out by an invading group or an invading force or inter tribal warfare, or anything. Mm. I mean, the whole world's a haunted house. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> it's it's there. There are probably you know more people have have died you know within a uh, within a fifty foot spot of where you stand when you go somewhere than have died in most haunted houses. But you just don't <laughs> you just don't realize it. Mm. <laughs> totally. Totally. And, um, you know, Knittelfeld, this um, town I mentioned before, is very, very close to uh, Stretweg. You've probably never heard of it, but uh, that has been a very important place for um, the, the Celts who lived here. The, um, they had this uh, kingdom, uh, Noricum, it was called by the, by the Romans. And there is one um, especially beautiful object, um, the uh, Stretweger Kultwagen, it's called in German. It's, um, it's no, like a uh, chariot. Yeah. yeah, not not quite, but um, a cultic object. Um, and uh, they, they, they are holding like a, a bowl or a grail uh, kind of thing. And um, it's on display here. And that's so very, very so close to, to this town where, uh, where there are high strangeness phenomena. So it's a statue, or it's a, uh, or it's an idol, or something. Yes. Um, no, it, there are many people. It's it's like um, like a a procession, but it's it's mounted on wheels. 
And it's made of, out of copper, I think. I'm not sure. If okay. Or bronze. Or uh, bronze. Bronze, I think. Yeah, something like that, yeah. Interesting. What do they uh what do they think it was used for? Just for, for rituals? Yeah, maybe. Um I'm searching for it. This one. Let's see here. Oh, there's even a an English Wikipedia page. The Stradweg cult wagon. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow. This thing is fascinating. Uh, yeah. It's it's and, much more ornate than I suspected it would be. Mm-hmm. And they, wow. they found it in uh, in the town where where I went to school, and uh, that's very close to Knittelfeld, the other town. And, and uh, the whole area is uh, an area of of here yeah, high strangeness phenomena, UFO sightings. Um, uh, we know a couple there. They uh, they are photographers, and they have tons, really tons of film and and uh, photo material. And they were visited by Men in Black and so on. It's just, uh, uh, it's like out of the movies. Mm. Wow, that's um, that's amazing. Now, are, are there any? Um, you mentioned the tunnels. Are there any sort of Neolithic uh, standing stones or? Uh, yes. Mm. Oh yes. wow. Okay. Yeah. Wow. There, there are special stones um, uh, that are typical for this region here, uh, the Menhirs. Um, the standing stones with um, with a hole in in them. They they're called Lochsteine in German. Um, no, it's just translators hole stones. They uh, they look like you know like a needle, a standing stone, and there's um, a hole on top of it. And um, the interesting thing is that um, when you when you look through the hole, your your eye view is like directed in in one way in a certain direction. And if you follow that direction, you come to the next standing stone with the next hole in it, and uh, that leads you in a different direction, and so on. And um, this uh, Professor Kush has found out if you uh, trace your uh, your way you're going uh, above ground, you're following the tunnels underground. Mm. Oh wow! This way, yeah, I, so, I've, yeah, I've, I am. Um, you know, I went to. Uh, Ireland this past October, and I've really developed a pretty keen interest in, in, uh, I mean, I think that it's one of the beautiful things about being into anomalous things is that it actually makes you or encourages you to look into areas that you previously didn't really consider, um, not, not consider that interesting, but you just didn't really think that was, you would want to do more research on, but I'm growing to, uh, I'm growing to have an interest, um, in, um, in, sort of that Neolithic uh, ancient sites sort of thing. Uh, you know, I, I, as much as I was complaining about the lack of ancient sites in the, uh, in the Southeastern U S I did have the chance to go to um, the Etowah mounds here um, in North Georgia. And they're really quite, uh, quite uh, imposing. Um, Is, are they I, uh, uh, part of the mount building culture? Yes. 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 Uh, okay. It's 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 one of the. It, there aren't a ton of. Um, there are, I believe, other culture uh, mounds in Georgia. One of which is a, a recreation, uh, so that doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the, 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 then these other two. Um, but uh, it's interesting to me. I, I I I've been thinking about you know if if we think about the fairy folk as being. Um, as being perhaps uh, one and the same with the dead or being uh, entities that uh, sort of commune with the dead. Um, and we look at, you know, sort of the, the, the mound structures that you'll find the the, the ring forts and whatnot that you'll find in the, in the in the mounds that you'll find in the British Isles. I, I can't help but wonder what, you know, uh, early settlers to America with that sort of uh, cultural, framework would have thought of these giant uh these gigantic uh you know mound building culture uh structures in in, in america if they ever sort of made that sort of same assumption or that same connection as well mm. um but you know it's it's an idea that i've been idea that i've been sort of uh sort of warming up to for some time is that perhaps everything that we see everything that we're experiencing in the paranormal for the most part is you know just a giant ghost story <laughs> yeah you know 
It's yeah. um, I mean, that's 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 obviously a gross oversimplification. Sure, but yeah, uh, sure. but you know, sometimes I want I I don't think that uh, that sort of idea gets a lot of traction, and it's something that I'm I'm wanting to explore a little bit more. Um, you know, having said that, I think that. <laughs> if everything is a giant ghost story, ghost stories are a lot more strange than we realize. <laughs> a lot stranger than we realize. Exactly. Um, but you know, it's it's a, it's an idea that I've been I've been uh, entertaining. Um, that's fascinating, though. I, I I didn't know about any of these uh, these sites in Austria. That's that's really interesting. Yeah. It's basically the center of uh, well, one of the major centers of this culture of the Celtic culture in in Central Europe. Um, and so the, it was basically uh, the the barrier or the border between the uh, uh, Romans and the so so to say barbaric uh, uh, tribes that was around here roughly. Yeah, yeah. The, the Celts got assimilated by the Romans. There was yeah. this um, right. Yeah, as as they did everywhere, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as, as in most of Europe, yeah, sure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but we have we have lots of um, you know folklore traditions that uh, date back to the Celtic times. Um, you know, uh, we for us they they are just normal stuff. You know, we we grew up with them. You know, the erecting of the maypole and uh, harvesting festivals, and uh, on the twenty one of June, the, there are uh, fire wheels, pin wheels uh, that are. Um, uh, coming down the mountains um, uh, to to celebrate the light and so on and so on and they all date back to to Celtic times. And for our, for us, it's just yeah, a normal it's... part of the culture, yeah, <laughs> and without any uh, super t superstition or spirituality or something attached to it. It's just you know you you meet around town and you go there and you have the, the festivals and stuff. But yeah. <laughs> It's just a normal part of the yeah. Culture. That's something that that that's something that I find uh, endlessly fascinating is that you know it, I'm I'm not implying that there isn't a rich indigenous history uh, to the U.S. It's just that the structures, for the most part, setting aside the obvious like the mound building culture, um, you know, for the most part, the structures haven't survived. But uh, it's astounding to you know. So something over here is really old if it's about you know. <laughs> This is about 400, 300 or 400 years old. It's, yeah. it's astounding over here, but you know, <laughs> over, yeah, exactly over, over in Europe and the British Isles, it's just the, 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 the depth of time uh, mm -hmm. that you're able to, 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 to take a look at is just, and, and it's, and it's, you know, it's interesting. Again, my experience in, in Ireland was, it just, <laughs> it just got so, I never thought it would get old, but it's like, oh, Leah, look, it's another castle, you know? <laughs> As an American, yeah, like, exactly. It's just, it's yeah, just, just another castle. <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting. I, I feel like when you uh, when you can actually reach out and touch, uh, when you can actually reach out and touch some of these older structures, it's almost like you feel connected to the past in a really profound way. I know that sounds a bit trite, but uh, it really is. It really is uh, astounding. It really yeah. is. Yeah, you have um, to experience it to to get the meaning of it. Hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, um, I'm just reminded um, the subterranean tunnels. They of course have their um, paranormal activities around them as well. Um, you know, orbs and uh, time loops and so on. And there is also um, a, a rich um, fairy lore surrounding them. Mm. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they they are not called fairies. They are called uh, Murifrauen. Just Muri women that don't know what it means. Um, okay. Like, you know, small uh, women with hairy feet, and they came out of these tunnels and uh, brought food to, to people. And then, uh, and, and, you know, all the, the stuff that goes along with fairy lore goes along with them as well. Um, the, the singing, the uh, missing time, uh, the, uh, I'm not sure about changelings, uh, but. Yeah, uh, sometime they, they say they went back under the earth, uh, under the hills, and um, maybe they come up again, but you don't know. Right. Yeah, that's, basically, that's interesting. Was, yeah. So, uh, I mean, yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, just wanted to add one. Uh, basically, the church started to destroy everything. They, they flooded the tunnels. Uh, the. the yeah. um, they reconstructed the rivers, uh, river flows, uh, they to to flood those tunnels. Um, 
one day because it was all demons and all evil and we have exactly to, yeah and yeah. people are just now starting to dig out uh the tunnels again and and yeah no but you're, you're right on about that being the being just a variation on fairy lore i mean generally speaking the rule of thumb for identifying whether or not folklore is could be interpreted as a fairy is is stature you know stature uh, do mm -hmm. they live underground do they live underground and do they like to you know steal people <laughs> they like to, they like to um so you know i think i think that, that the, yeah, that's I, I had never heard of this in particular before although it's not surprising that the, that the church just went through and uh, that's that's it makes you wonder how much we've lost truly um yeah through the sort of ignorance but you know it's interesting the um the uh it's interesting the the description you said short women with hairy feet i think of <laughs> i'm thinking of hobbits now yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm sorry hairy legs hairy legs oh hairy legs even better yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's really interesting i I never heard of that man you you, you you gentlemen definitely live in a very uh interesting area that's yes. wild yeah, we, we are just realizing that for the last uh, couple of years because you know uh, growing up here it just was so normal and you know oh yeah of course in the british isles because yeah you know i love the, the the celtic mythology and yeah i was aware that uh, yeah i'm i'm living here and but you know the romans destroyed everything and uh, what was left standing was destroyed by the church and so but no they are still here the, and and the uh, um the myths and uh, uh, the encounters you know the the high strangeness hotspots they are they are here oh yeah, yeah. and, and it, it, it's amazing to me how much i mean how much this folklore in general really permeates through to our modern day um you know there's there's well we just mentioned like you know the term the stroke you know mm -hmm. um as being part of the fairy stroke the term boogeyman if you've ever heard of the, you know the boogeyman yes. uh is comes from uh comes from you know the the bug bear which was a type of fairy used to abduct people you know people wonder why you throw salt over your shoulder or knock on wood that those those sort of superstitions probably have uh you know at least some connection to fairy lore and i just it's, it's amazing to me how you can be the most skeptical person in the world, but you are encountering and saying things that uh, were inspired by folklore um, every day, every single Definitely. day. Yeah, in, in German as well. Yeah, you know, our um, word for nightmare, um, Albtraum, uh, derives from the the Alben, uh, the, the elves. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, a, a nightmare is um, literally means a dream uh, about or uh, deriving from the elves interesting yeah, yeah that, that reminds me um you got you gentlemen will probably appreciate this um are you familiar with the uh the alba the alba twitch yes okay yeah. so have you as, yeah. have you have you ever heard about a, a lot of people were trying to suspect that they thought that alba twitch was uh so it's for anybody who doesn't know, I guess, um, the Alba Twitch is supposedly a small, short, uh, hairy creature that uh, inhabits this one very specific area in Pennsylvania, um, or centered around a, uh, a landmark known as Chickie's Rock. And it was uh, allegedly it would uh, harass picnickers and often steal their apples. So people thought that the term Alba Twitch was somehow from like the apple snitch or something like that. But um, a good friend of mine, uh, Timothy Renner, Who's in that? Who's from that area and specializes in folklore? I think has sort of solved the mystery of where that term comes from. And uh, feel free to correct me if I'm inc if if I'm wrong with my pronunciation or anything, gentlemen. But uh, he suspects that the term Alba Twitch didn't come from the apple snitch, but it actually came from Albus, so elf, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, and and Twitchin, which means uh, does that mean to sort of escape? Uh, or to flee with a sort of uh, sort of um, grace is is that is that is that, is, is that a word that y'all? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure. Okay, maybe maybe the I mean it's it's uh, the Pennsylvania was uh, full of uh, German um, immigrants. Yeah, that, generally called the Pennsylvania Dutch, even though they're actually of German descent. They were called, yeah, yeah. Pennsylvania Deutsch is what they were trying to say, and they called them the Pennsylvania Dutch. Yeah. So it most likely derived from uh, some uh, Germanic uh, language dialect or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, 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 I um, found it interesting. You know, Albus. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 word too. I mean, I, I, 
it's interesting, you know, the the, the Harry Potter books yeah. <laughs> are really full of a lot of this stuff that I don't, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't realize until I started looking into it. But oh. uh, you know, uh, even the you know, Al, Albus Dumbledore, um, mm-hmm. the uh, Hagrid, the bog- Hagrid. Hagrid, Hagrid, yep, yeah. yep, Hagrid, uh, the the uh, the Boggart as one of the mm-hmm. creatures. Um, so these little connections that uh, are actually pretty pretty impressive. And again, I think I think we're just we're just swimming in this sea of folklore that we just don't even realize completely. Um, do, do you know what England was called in the olden times? Um, it's called what? Albion. Albion. It's the same root. Alb. As Al- Al- oh, yeah. nice, nice. That's interesting. I had no idea, and that, that sort of that sort of like uh, that sort of brings to mind the notion that some people it's it's sort of not in favor anymore. But the notion that uh, the fairies are some sort of ancestral memory of of indigenous people, short indigenous people. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. In fact, in in fact, I know one. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is <laughs> there is one indigenous shaman here in Europe. Um, mm-hmm. He's called Dusty Miller. Um, he's very old now, and um, he says that um, he descends from the um, Aborigines of the British Isles that were there before the Celts arrived. So the, would, the, would, these, would this be a uh, Pictish, I guess? And um, not really, because the the Picts they were in the north in, in what is now Scotland. Okay, okay, okay. and. Um, uh, he says he um, he descends from people who lived, you know, what is today Kent and south of England, mm-hmm. and um, and he uh, he's a widely respected shaman, and um, he yeah he tells the story that uh, he has not only got this memory of of his own past lives, but a sort of an ancestral memory. Uh, he he. Um, it's it's interesting when uh, I I went with him uh, through Kent and uh, at several points he was like oh yeah yeah I know here here there stood um, you know this hospital in Roman times and so on it was just like oh yeah I remember from my childhood <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> yeah he, he he basically carries on uh, the the tribe uh, tradition or the tribe memory in a way because they have a they have a very small uh, they derive uh, from a, they are basically survivors uh, of of uh, of a tribe of those people and who always uh, were quite close uh, closed uh, towards the outside and they they gave the the tradition of the tribe uh, uh, from one son to the other uh, and yeah they carry some kind of a strange tribe memory somehow and, and, and he's and one he of the last that, of them yeah 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 and, and he says that uh, you know of course um they were like like every uh, aboriginal people uh, the um, invading culture slaughtered them and uh, and um and they had to hide and and so on and um and yeah he, uh, in fact he he says that um his ancestors were quite small and um they they didn't cut their hair so they they were uh, viewed as very hairy and so on and um yeah, it it quite neatly ties into this uh, descriptions of uh, the the small people in the woods, uh, the 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 fey folk. Yeah, you know, I'm I, I'm I'm certainly. I feel like the idea of this ancestral memory and the fact that the sort of this blanket term fairies is describing uh, an older sort of indigenous people. I'm actually kind of it's it's. It's such a parsimonious and uh, such a clear way of of describing this, the phenomena that I'm actually pretty receptive to it. Um, you know, if 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 we think of the fairies as being associated with the dead or as being the dead, then it makes sense that you know perhaps there would be this connection to an older civilization, and it really does. It really does map on quite well. Um, I know that the idea was again popular with uh, with anthropologists and the like um especially in the in the early first half of the 20th 20th century um but i don't necessarily see why that should be um in conflict especially with you know if you if you look at how human history and and our understanding of uh human cultures keeps on getting pushed further and further back in time um how it seems like we were doing a lot more 
a lot longer ago <laughs> than we realized. Um, I think this is all sort of leads to an aggregate of evidence that 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 may indeed be the case that these are uh, ancestral memories, but also somehow something a little bit more, a little bit more, uh, for lack of a better term, spooky. You know, the, that idea that there's actually something genuinely anomalous going on there alongside mm-hmm. of this, alongside of this interpretation of an earlier culture. Yeah. And uh, to quote Gordon once again, uh, it's uh, not to quote, but, but you know, to, uh, to, to take up on his meaning, uh, it's, it, it's on us uh, to, to unravel that mystery because uh, materialism has failed and uh, uh, who, if not the magicians, should do it. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's, you know, I, I had my wife ask me what, I really like, you know, what do you, what do you get out of this working with these things and writing about these things? What do you get out of this? Um, you know, what's, why, why, why do you have a passion about this? And really that's, I think that's what it is. I, I I'm so tired of the materialist model mm. and how narrow it is and how it seeks to, it seeks to rob individuals of, I mean, not to get preachy and I, I hope that you'll interpret my, my meaning here, but it, it robs people of, uh, their spiritual birthright mm-hmm. um, that we all have as human beings, and I think that's what really gets me um, gets me not upset, but that's really really what drives me is is I feel like talking about these things really uh, serves to further undermine this materialist grip that we're all in the middle of um, in the West. Yep, yeah. that's one of the reasons we do this show. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's 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 just I think I think Gordon described it as the uh the person the person who got drunk at your party and slept on your couch and doesn't know when to leave the next morning. That's what materialism is now. <laughs> exactly, yeah. He suddenly yeah. thinks it's it's his own couch and his own house, yeah. Yeah. yeah and but that's just, uh, and, the, 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 I think that's one of the major things people have to or, or for me in, in the in the uh, in my development over the years and in my magical practice, it was one day everything turned upside down and it was like realizing, fuck, they are sitting in our pool in a way and they are peeing in our pool and it's not the other way around and it's not we have <laughs> to prove to them. It's pool. like, what the fuck, guys? Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you if you just... If you just look at the... Uh, the... Uh, depth of human history and even you know, heck heck with the with human history if you just look at the world today you know the materialist uh stance is has been historically a minority if you look at you know the, the history of development and even today i mean if you look at sort of the, the position of people in the world you know if you go to a if you go to a lap shaman and try to talk to them about materialism, they're going to laugh you out of the, off the tundra, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, we, we, we like to think that we, and in, in, so, in some ways I, I, I feel like in that sense, materialism is kind of a little bit racist. Um, a little it's this bit, idea yeah. <laughs> that, you know, well, the white people have figured this out. So, yeah, exactly. you know, we've got this under control. Um, Just cultural and, chauvinism. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's it's so it's I think that yeah, I, I think that there's a, a smugness that comes with with the materialist standpoint that just has into, has really started to rub me the wrong way. And you know, I, I I sort of have to sit back and and not get too upset about it because uh we you know, it's it's I feel like it's going in the right direction. I feel like um I feel like the the materialist stranglehold is really loosening a good bit and I feel like it's going to get get better as, as time goes on. Um, you've got people like Dean Radin doing really top notch work. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll, it'll be, it's, it's on its way out. We'll see. I feel like, you know, I feel like it's, it's astounds me how many times the astounds me how many times, uh, we can see science, claim that it's reached its pinnacle and that it has the world figured out <laughs> and then that's thrown to the side but we still make the same mistakes nowadays every you know, every it's decade yeah it's, it's just amazing <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, the, um, we we talked about the the Alps, uh, the dead people and stuff uh, before. Um, and I, if you guys don't have an don't uh, are finished, so to say, with this uh, part, uh, I'd like to to open another one. Uh, which is, um, yeah, I, I asked you before uh, if you're familiar with uh, the work of Robert Monroe mm -hmm. and the uh, the Hemisync program and the Monroe Institute. Uh, it's the, the out-of-body um, traveling stuff and uh, the binaural beats to synchronize the brain waves and so on. That's a long story. Uh, most of our German-speaking listeners know uh, about it because we talk quite a lot of about it because it intertwines with a lot of our work and the stuff we do mm -hmm. um so um and it, it was basically one of the first things i started uh, out, uh, out of body training uh the hemisync programs uh over the years uh, so it is a quite uh, regular practice in my magical uh, work so to say and interestingly interestingly enough uh, we had um I think it was 2010, I visited a seminar from a guy who is a former trainer of the Monroe Institute. Uh, he lives in Germany and he basically developed his own technique. Uh, it's a called uh, Holosync 3D, uh, which, hmm. which uses uh, 3D surround sound effects. It, I'm, I'm very oversimplifying everything here, but mm -hmm. it's, it uses a uh, 3D surround sound for this uh, hemispheric uh, synchronization stuff, and it p puts you places where you where well the the standard binaural beats uh, well they don't reach there, so to say. So it's an amazing technique, and um, I trained with him and uh, for years, and uh, I, I I asked him if he about aliens so to say you know this gray aliens what's your opinion on this because he does a lot of uh i think he's I, i would say he's on the same level when it comes to robert monroe like flipping his finger and turning uh so to say mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um and I'm, i've had some very crazy experiences with him and he's a very serious researcher and he's he really knows his his stuff so I take his uh, opinion, I, I value his opinion, let's call it this way. Um, and I asked him about aliens and grace and, mm -hmm. you know, you have encountered something like that. And he he, he looked at me and he said, yes, uh, I don't really like to talk about it, but um, he encountered, um, let's, let's call it gray aliens. And in his mm -hmm. opinion, it's, they are physical beings and they, they c come from, from different planets Uh, but they, they like the, the, uh, the, uh, inhabit a different realm, so to say. It's like, um, he, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the whole brainwave stuff. You have the alpha, the beta brainwaves and the alpha brainwaves yeah. and the, the theta, theta levels. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. And the, the deep delta states. So, which are, uh, related somehow to different states of consciousness, to different states of trance, to different experiences like the sleep paralysis and uh, uh, out-of-body experiences. Oh, uh, most of the time happens in the theta levels uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the, the hypnagogic state and so and the uh, alleged hallucinations you have there. And right. from, from in, in his experience, he said it's, it's like they are physical beings, so they are there, but they, they are basically... Uh, inhabiting the theta level plane of existence so he, he he explained it in a way like each like the delta brain waves and stuff they are like different levels of ex of existence um like different layers so to say and uh, this beings um inhabits the theta levels so to say and there's a lot of crazy stuff going on and from my opinion uh, from my experiences it it matches a lot of uh, of uh, encounters you know on, on psychedelics where your brain waves go down into the th theta and uh, delta levels and so on and with meditation so it it, it sounded uh, like an interesting note so to say that that makes sense to me i mean if you look at like if you look at things like well for example i know that like a, a gansfield experiment where you put you know mm -hmm. Uh, halved ping pong balls over your eyes will induce a theta state and that's obviously a similar technique that you see to, to something like scrying or, or you know reading reading flames or something along those lines as that's well like gazing mm -hmm. um so that seems to make that seems to make sense um that's, that does seem to make sense uh so there so his his contention is that they are 
physical beings using th- using theta states or using different brainwave states as a means to communicate and or travel or or they just inhabit that they're physical but they inhabit that uh, wavelength somehow both um it's hmm. it's it's uh on the one hand it's a communication layer uh on the other hand it is they, they are basically living there or quite uh, most of the time living there or can easily go there in a way um we we had other interesting topics to talk about so we didn't go into too much depth there um i might just ask him another time <laughs> that is that is really <laughs> interesting details. though but it, it for me it, oh, was, I- it, it covers the 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 problems in, in a lot of of the um uh, different hypotheses and the the di- different experiences because a lot of people say well it is just an internal aspect of yourself it's an internal aspect of consciousness other people think it's like a physical being and real other people say well that's not that much of a difference um it's just like a quite artificial difference of this alleged inside and the alleged outside of realities and uh, just because something is not on the outside doesn't mean it's not could, couldn't be it couldn't exist uh, on a on a physical level uh, i'm not sure if you if if that made sense what i just said but no it, it no it, may, it makes 100% sense i mean it, it you're right it is it is a very helpful solve for why these things crop up in altered states why there does seem to be a physical component you know because that's the thing is we can talk all day about there being some sort of other world and about there being, you know, altered states of consciousness involved. But at the end of the day, you know, things happen to the physical reality. Exactly. Now, of course, you know, if you look, if you look at psi phenomena, psi phenomena can have an effect on the physical world as well. So that's not that much of a problem, but uh, this idea this concept is really actually really is um, quite, uh, quite uh, efficient in the way that it describes in the way that it describes a lot of the different aspects of this of this uh, of this uh, phenomena, I think that's really interesting. That's a really interesting novel sort of idea. Yeah, and it's it's basically basically comes from uh, actual magical practice, so to say, or from consciousness uh, experience, and not from theorizing so much about it. It's, and it's something you can learn. It's it's basically it's quite easy. To, man, it's you have, you you have people have have talents for it or not but you you can uh, enter those states of consciousness and you can experience that um you can experience different states of consciousness when you go into alpha brainwave states or into delta brainwave states it's it's a completely different world there and you can even go beyond delta and it's it's it really literally is a different re- realm a different uh plane of existence and it's with its own rules and with its own yeah it's really strange there um and it's it's like the it's like the the fairy stories again mm-hmm. you know uh, you you go through a portal into their realm um and uh, you you just don't realize when you've crossed the threshold but yeah. then you're there and uh, uh mm-hmm. maybe they inhabit the same place but they are invisible for our normal eyes you have to uh, change your state of consciousness mm-hmm. And there you we know, are back in with Terence McKenna again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sometimes I wonder, you know, so sometimes I wonder if the things that seem like mundane aspects of a lot of these encounters aren't in fact the important thing that helps to initiate contact. So you talked about the, uh, the music Mm-hmm. that you heard and you're know, thinking about this you know the, the concept of binaural beats sometimes i wonder if there isn't some sort of whatever this other is can tap into something like, like that that same idea that same um for lack of a better term technology you know in mm-hmm. the sense that magic is a technology yeah. um it, to to sort of initiate that sort of experience you know mm-hmm. and i wonder if that that's not what the, the music might have something to do with that you know and th- this music is something that uh, i'm not sure if if, if uh, a lot of people are familiar i think it's 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 quite commonly known in the in the in the uh, you know the whole uh, out of body experience uh, community. But if you if, when you meditate or when you lay in bed or when you are in this like half awake, half asleep state, very very mm-hmm. often you start to listen to you to hear these spherical sounds and like like a chore uh, chore uh, like a boy chore uh, singing Cor- chorus uh, yeah. chor- chorus uh, singing and. Uh, like these spheric sounds, uh, just because you lay, lay, in, lay in bed and you do your uh, 
calming down the body, shutting down the body, and being aware uh, in your in your mind. And suddenly you you hear it it, it the the story uh, Bernard told before about the the, the spheric sounds. It's ju something that happens quite a lot in this altered states of consciousness. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it's interesting. People, you know, after writing the brimstone deceit and the tr and a trojan feast before it people were assuming that i was going to write a sound book and i kind of want to but at the same time it's just so it's such a daunting idea because there is so much to talk about i mean how mm. not you know al almost every encounter does include some sort of sound but in terms of the role of sound you've got the anomalous music you've got um you know the oz effect where all mm -hmm. the sound in some of these, in some of these sightings, you know, is removed. Um, but then you, I think you have, do have to bring in concepts like binaural beats. I think you have to talk about, you know, um, the, uh, the ayahuascaros who sing their Icaros while you're mm -hmm. under your, uh, you know, that, 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 for them, that's a, a vital part of that experience is their singing, which sort of allows the visualization through singing of the experience. Mm -hmm. So, exactly. um, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. You know, I think that, The nose is underappreciated, but I think that uh, the role of sound is underappreciated too. Yeah, that that sounds like a book that wants to be written by you as well. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I guess I, I guess I've got to. I don't know. <laughs> I guess I got yeah, to. Yeah, I, I need I'll, to get three. About... I need to get this. I need to get this current one out the door. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm. Oh, sorry, you broke up there. What? Yeah, I, I'm just reminded of uh, the, the mantras and and. All the magic formulas and, and spells you're uh, and incantations, to say, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. everything that's uh, quite powerful sounds. Mm. Yeah, I think it's. I think it needs to be. Yeah, it does need to be written. It's going to take a minute though. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to take. It's going to take a little while. I've got to. Got to get this current one out the door. Mm. Uh, and well, well, it will. We are by. Uh, Here we are uh, with uh, Terence McKenna, uh, with his machine elves and his uh, experiences, mm -hmm. where they basically, well, more or less for pushed him to to make sounds to st when he was in the hyperspace and uh, met the DMT in the DMT realms, and they, re they right. pushed him to make sounds to to uh, create stuff and these multidimensional globs of. Um, astounding, uh, whatever <laughs> he couldn't. Yeah, no, even that, Terence that couldn't find of, words for it. So that <laughs> they were they were sort of making toys and trinkets out of the uh, yeah out of the sound. Out of and they pushed him to. Well, say and, if you, and also if you look at um, you know, sorry, if you look at the uh, the importance of the uh, the meditation tone, you know. Om or Ia or you know that's a lot of people think that's where Yahweh came from is from this this uh, this reciting tone mm -hmm. you know Ya 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 mm -hmm. and the, the idea that uh, you know um, in at least the Judaic traditions um, the idea that it was a, a breath which caused the creation of the world through through breath through the word you know mm -hmm. um, damn this is a book that needs to be written <laughs> 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 the logos explanation or something like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I'm reminded of, uh, you know, all these um, fairy stories where the lonesome wanderer hears the elves singing and uh, he hides at first and uh, they, they repeat uh, this one song over and over again and he knows another uh, passage or something like that and he, uh, he just jumps in and he... He sings it, and and so they uh, uh, he is made known to them by making. Yeah, sounds. there was. Um, yeah, there's a there's a there's a one uh, legend from Ireland that I particularly remember, um, where the elves or the 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 little people were reciting the days of the week, but they were just going like Monday. Monday, Tuesday, Monday, Tuesday, Monday, yes. Tuesday, and someone comes in and says Wednesday, and they all really love that because you know <laughs> yeah. traditionally, traditionally Wednesday is is the fairy day, which you know we can also talk about the fact that John Keel thought that you know mm -hmm. anomalous things, especially UFO sightings, happen on Wednesdays, but that's neither here nor there. But then um, 
uh, someone else came along and said, heard them going Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and he thought that he could get the same sort of benefits that the other guy did. So he goes Thursday, and of course Thursday was traditionally the day that Christ was uh, crucified, and it, it was it was it was the least you know fairy day. Um, so he, he ended up he ended up. Uh, I think the first gentleman had his hunch back. His his hunch was removed, and the second gentleman had a hunch added to him because it was Thursday. He didn't, he didn't know the right word. Um, oh, fuck. <laughs> Hunchbacks, fairy blasts, implants, strange food, sounds or smells. Some very weird things you can experience encountering the other indeed. In the second part of our conversation, we explore the role of psychedelics, another important piece of the puzzle. You've been listening to a production by Edition Prequel and Edition Gwydion. Intro and outro songs from the original soundtrack of Pantherium. Lyrics by Jörg Vogeltanz. Music by Christian Gschier. Text by Dionne. More mysteries, mindfuck and magic at YouTube slash Reicherstark and www.reicherundstark.at.